Hello and welcome to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast, a resilience podcast where we talk about all the challenging things that we're working to overcome like anxiety, health and relationship issues. My name is Sarah. This week on the podcast, we continue with our Pandas Pans Awareness Month on the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. Last week, we talked to Dr. Bach, and before that, we spoke with Gabriella True from the Aspire organization. So we've touched on leading in Panda's Pans and some of the issues. We've talked about treatment. Now I want to dig into an issue that I know has touched many in the Panda's Pans communities, and that is mold toxicity. So Dr. Jill Krista is here to speak with us. She is literally a rock star in terms of mold treatment. She's going to explain all about mold, how mold toxicity works, why this is different from a mold allergy, and then also making the link to treatment and pandas pants. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. Dr. Jill Krista is an amazing resource. She's an author, educator, and a naturopathic doctor. She has personal experience with both pandas pans and with mold toxicity. She earned her naturopathic doctor degree in 2003 and then for over a decade owned, directed, and practiced at two integrative clinics. She now focuses on research, teaching, and writing, specializing in neuroinflammatory conditions like mold sickness, brain injury, and autoimmune encephalitis. Dr. Krista also recently released a new book, Break the Mold. I hope you enjoy this conversation and learn as much as I did from Dr. Jill Krista. So welcome, Dr. Jill Krista, to the podcast. I'm happy to connect with you today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really Mm -hmm. wonderful for me to be able to, to make the link between mold and pandas and pans. That's great. So why don't we start with you providing a quick overview of your background for those people that maybe haven't heard of you before or or are just meeting you today, and then how you got interested in pandas and pans, and then also treating mold toxicity. Sure. So I'm a naturopathic doctor, which means I'm trained as a primary care doctor. When I set up practice, I'm in southern Wisconsin, which turned out to be a Lyme endemic area. So by default, then I became a Lyme specialist because my patients, usually with naturopathic medicine, we're in the business of finding and treating the cause. And it can be quite elegant when you find the cause. And you ha- I have very, very hardworking patients. They are willing to do the homework, you know, the, the diet change, mm-hmm. take the herbs, you know, all of those things. So um, usually when we find and treat the cause and you have a hardworking person on the other end, implementing all of it things get better. And I had this group that just wasn't getting better. And that's when I discovered Lyme disease and how chronic Lyme can present. So I became a specialist in Lyme through ILADS, which is the International Society for Lyme and Associated Diseases. And that is a very, um, that they recognize that there's this thing called chronic Lyme or persistent Mm -hmm. Lyme disease. They recognize that there are co-infections with tick and mosquito bites and things like that. So I had a pretty good handle on that. And then I thought, okay, now we've found and treated the cause. And most people got better, but then there was a small set of patients that just were not getting better, even though they were doing 110% of the effort. Mm -hmm. And it turned out in one of those patients, they found black mold in his home. And it had been maybe a 10 or 12 year history based on the date that they remodeled their basement. And that's when I started thinking, huh, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I don't think I understand mold because he didn't, he had a little sinus congestion, a little bit of, you know, hay fever, but all the rest of the symptoms didn't fit with what I understood mold to be. It was things like chronic ear ringing, anxiety, insomnia, pelvic pain, urinary frequency, irritable bowel syndrome, um, achy painy joints, which we thought was the Lyme disease but we treated that and he still had achy painy joints. So it was just that thing of, hmm, I don't think I really get this. And the thing that really ticked it off for me that I need to understand it and really um, take it seriously was that he then had a cancer diagnosis. Oh wow! And as I got into the research, then I started being able to recognize that in almost all the other patients that had these persistent type symptoms, 
I wonder if mold could be what's going on there. And when, when I then interviewed them about their homes or their mold exposure, that kind of thing, sure enough, water damage building exposure was consistent with almost every single person. And that's when I was like, this is a majorly misunderstood condition and I uh, felt really compelled to start, you know, putting myself out there in my little realm, you know, of like, Hey, mold is a big deal. And this is how I'm treating it. That kind of thing. So I've been doing that for about 10 years and then we had mold in our own home. Oh, wow. And um, that's when I, I didn't know it. Uh, we moved into a relatively new home and it took a while. It was in the fall. I live in Wisconsin, you know, so windows were open. It was beautiful. And as we closed up the windows, we got more and more and more exposure and got sicker and sicker and sicker in ways that were very nondescript, um, started vague and got more seriously different in every person, which is all the mold things. Mm. <laughs> but I didn't recognize it, of course, because the brain fog was happening to me. And when the flood re revealed itself in February, so we've been exposed, you know, all that many months, I realized, oh, this is mold. I know what to do. So I knew who to call. I knew the inspector that I trusted and I knew the protocol to start and how to individualize it for all of my different family members that were getting sick. And that's when I felt compelled to write my book because I thought, you know, this isn't rocket science. Once you recognize it, most of the tools are things regular everyday people can do and they can get started on your, their health recovery. And then if things don't go well, they can see a mold literate doctor. And ideally you would see a mold literate doctor from the get go. But sometimes that's just not possible. Maybe you don't live near one, you know, those kinds of things. So I wrote my book in thinking that, you know, I was basically going to go to my patients. <laughs> it just mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. blew up and it made me realize what a massive problem mold is. And I'll tell you when we were, I'm a, pa I'm a parent of twins with pans, um, brought on by immune deficiency from congenital Lyme exposure. So there's some connection there of immune deficiency as the trigger for autoimmune disease of the brain. And that, that mold exposure caused such a flare in my kids. And one of them took about two years to really get recovered from. And so that's why I'm really excited about being on your podcast, because I want people to understand how important mold is in this picture, how underappreciated it is and how common it is. And that you can do something about it. You don't get as sick as we did. <laughs> Stop it right away and treat it. Are you interested in having a published author speak in your classroom or at your community event? I'd be interested in speaking about my new novel, Pendulum by S.E. German, the writing process, mental health, Panda's Pans, podcasting, and more. Contact me at reallifeprojectco at gmail.com for both in-person and online bookings. So I guess I know I've heard the term mold toxicity, um, you know, and it's obviously really important for us to know about this, whether, you know, we've got kind of a pre-existing condition. Um, you talked about some of the types of symptoms, but maybe are there any others that besides the ones that you've already mentioned? Sure. So I think it's important to understand how mold makes a person sick. It has kind of a quadruple weaponry. It can make you sick by the spores. So that can be allergies, sinusitis, sore throat, congestion, post-nasal drip, asthma. And those are the generally recognized symptoms that the CDC recognizes. There can also be mold fragments, which is when dead and dried mold gets disrupted. So when someone does a kitchen remodel or a bathroom remodel and they didn't know there was mold so they didn't have all the precautions in place mm -hmm. those fragments act like asbestos and they're highly inflammatory they're more inflammatory to our respiratory passages than the spores themselves and they can get into our lung tissue and sort of lock in and cause perpetual inflammation of the lungs so we see more lung related issues if you get a cold it goes to the lungs um, if it goes to the lungs it goes to bacteria those kinds of things and then a picture of what I call moldothelioma. <laughs> it's sort of like mesothelioma from asbestos exposure, but mm -hmm. from mold fragment exposure. So this can cause generalized inflammation all over the body. And then there are the chemicals that happily living metabolizing mold secretes. And that's, 
I jokingly call them mold farts because they're just off gassing. They're just eating and off gassing and eating and off gassing. And part of that off gas chemical is all the things that can make a person really chemically sensitive. So this is things like aldehydes, like formaldehyde is made is one of the aldehydes that we're familiar with. It's not one that mold secretes, but you can understand if we're preserving dead bodies in formaldehyde, you mm-hmm. don't want to be breathing aldehydes. You know, that's not a very not a very good thing to do to your respiratory passages. Other chemicals are MPA, which is mycophenolic acid. We use this in medicine as a very, very reliable immune suppressor. So if you're breathing mold farts, you're getting chemicals that we use to preserve the body and you're getting things that cause immune depletion just by breathing the air. The other thing that mold off gases when it's happily digesting is alcohol. So I have a little phrase, kind of a joke, like breathe moldy air, get drunk. Mm -hmm. So you can see spaciness, fatigue, vision problems. Kids have a hard time tracking when they read. Um, They have time, hard time with memory retention, those kinds of things, just from breathing moldy air where the mold is happily living and and metabolizing. But the worst weapon that it has is mycotoxins. So we have the spores, spore fragments, chemicals, and now we have mycotoxins. The mycotoxins are made intentionally by the mold when it feels threatened And the purpose or the intention of that mycotoxin is to kill or harm other living things in its area. We're not the target. The target is like other fungi and bacteria, but the the damaging things that it can do damage our cells as well, particularly our flora. You're probably hearing a lot about the microbiome now, you know, that we are, Mm -hmm. we are more, we have more um, DNA that's, that belongs to the microbes in our gut, the flora of our gut, than we do in our own body, which means if we are ingesting or breathing or intaking these chemicals into our system, we can get a massive change in the flora of our body through our respiratory passages, our sinuses, and our gut lining. When it's the sinuses, that's where we get the connection to pandas. Uh, because the sinuses then can get colonized. And so we can kind of talk about that concept a little bit. It's a little bit controversial. But what we see in sinusitis studies is that if somebody has been exposed to a water damage building, they can develop a biofilm. And that biofilm creates more sinus problems, worse outcomes from sinus surgery and persistent infections and inflammation. So in mold illness, when we see someone who has that kind of picture, we treat the sinuses. At least that's part of the way that I approach it because mm-hmm. that constant irritation and constant biofilm presence and mycotoxin formation, those can ride the olfactory bulb right up into the brain stem. And that's where we start getting some of the changes in the brain. So symptoms or mycotoxins, they're the hardest ones to pick out. And they're also, mycotoxins make up probably 70% of the symptoms in my patients. I was having a very hard time figuring out of my Lyme patients who had mold, or maybe they didn't have Lyme at all. Maybe they just had mold. Mm -hmm. So I took um, the inspiration from Dr. Horowitz's Lyme MSIDS questionnaire and used his system to develop my own clinical questionnaire for mold which is using categories and weighting the the score of a symptom picture or cluster a little heavier, a little lighter is whether it was pertaining more toward mold or not. And if anybody wants that questionnaire, you can go to my website on the courses page. It's a, it's a doctor questionnaire, but I also put it in my book and you don't have to get the book. You can just get the questionnaire if you go to the website and that will give you a picture of um, what is your mold risk score. So is it, nah, probably not mold is a problem, or you could be in the middle where it's mm, it's possible that it's mold, or you could be on the end of the spectrum where it's probable mold, and now you need to do some investigation. Do you want to know some of that? So you asked me about some of the symptoms with mycotoxins is kind of, yeah, it could be all over the place. So that's why I mentioned the questionnaire, but the, I'll list the commons and then the quirks, the quirks, the commons are fatigue brain fog, cognitive problems, insomnia, anxiety, or anxiousness. I'm trying to be careful not to say anxiety because it could just be an anxious, unrested feeling on the inside. Um, 
vision changes are quite, quite common, that someone will feel like their vision can change in an hour. Hmm. They might even go get new glasses and then the next day say, I don't think they did this right. I don't think these glasses are working. For kids, that's convergence disorder, which means that their eyes don't go across the page at the same rate, so they have reading issues. Um, so sort of thinking about, you know, if you're tipsy, your eyes don't quite work all that well. That's the that's kind of the idea. You can also have irritable bowel syndrome, constipation or diarrhea or a mixture of both. And a lot of um, bloating or tendency to have candida overgrowth, which is really common with kids with pans and pandas. We can also see skin reactions um, in a healthier kid. You're going to see louder skin reactions because that's a safer way for your body to detoxify is through the skin. Ear ringing is one of the quirks that's very common with mold exposure. And it makes sense because some of the highest drug classes that we know that cause ear ringing are antibiotics. And we get antibiotics from fungi. We get penicillin from penicillium mold. Mm. Uh, so that kind of is like, ooh, clink, clink. You know, <laughs> yeah. you don't necessarily have to have sinus or respiratory congestion at all if all you're being exposed to is the mycotoxins. If the spores and the spore fragments are behind building material or under flooring or in your crawl space or in your attic, then the mycotoxins are being pulled into the air of that space. And you don't have you can have mold related illness without any allergic or spore related symptoms. You can even have a normal allergy test to mold, but still have mold related illness that's related to mycotoxin exposure. Another quirk of mycotoxins is urinary frequency and pelvic pain. And I'm trying to think I know I'm missing something really big, but <laughs> maybe I, we might hit them as we go. Yeah, oh, no, sure. Point inflammation. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess, things, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I can see how those are really all over the place and, and all yeah, over. totally that it would be very difficult to put it together what's going on. Mm-hmm. And so I do get this question a lot. Like, so this is, so there is the part that's more allergy, but it's not like a mold allergy. I know a lot of people say, oh, I have a mold allergy. Um, so when it's outside, leaves are breaking down, things like this. But in in this case, does the mold actually then stay in your body? Yeah, so it can be a mold allergy. You can have more sensitivity to outdoor molds than you used to or more sensitivity okay. than the normal person. And that can be, for me, that is a little like, hmm, I wonder if there is a water damage building exposure, because if the if you've been in that exposure long enough and you've been exposed to the mycotoxins long enough, the message in that toxin when it interacts with your sinus flora and your respiratory passages is I want to move in. Mm. I want to come in and compost you. I'm here to do my job. And so your own flora initially will have a, a defensive response. And if the mycotoxins keep showing up and keep showing up, then your your body goes into kind of um, assault mode <laughs> and trying to fight with normal flora. So your normal flora becomes a pathogenic biofilm. And in that case, then spores can move in and you become that moldy building. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's kind oh, of a wow. continuum. I see it as a continuum. Yeah, no, and that's for sure scary. Um, and so you mentioned that your twins have pans and, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. That's super challenging, I'm sure, as as it's been for us. Um, yeah. And then also Lyme disease. So are there certain like health profiles that you notice are kind of more vulnerable um, to getting mold toxicity? Or is it kind of the same for everybody? Like if you're in a, a building this this is likely to happen? Great question. It is more the norm than the exception that everyone will have a different time before they are symptomatic and different um, severity of symptom, not just different symptoms, but severity of symptoms as well. And that's also what makes it very confusing because we can then get into the rationale, you know, rationale it away kind of thing of like, well, only I'm the only one that seems to be affected. And, you know, three other people in this household don't seem to be affected. So it's probably not mold. Mm. That's probably not the thing. And that is not the way to think about it. If one person in the house is symptomatic and it may be mold, you're the canary that can save misery and suffering for the rest of your family. 
it's all variant on genetic susceptibility. It's variant on your nutritional status, which mold you're being exposed to and where you are in your life. There are certain molds that are really big hormone disruptors. And so a kid that's about to go into puberty or a woman who's going through perimenopause, they're going to feel it much more than a man who's kind of at an even keel hormone state. Um, so which mold you're exposed to, you know, how much you're exposed. And I, I have to remind people that, and it typically tends to be men that are less affected. Um, or that it takes a little more time. And that's because these toxins are fat soluble. So women and children tend to just have more fat. And so we tend to accumulate them a lot faster. And I try to remind the people who are not symptomatic that militaries around the world use mycotoxins as biowarfare. They wouldn't do that if it didn't affect everybody. So it's just a matter of time, duration, dose, type, and your susceptibility. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So it's not just, you know, kind of your your genetic profile to begin with or, or right. what you've got going on. Um, so I guess maybe let's get into... How do we find out then, is it worth testing or is it only then if we've noticed a mold damage building? What is your your pathway usually to figuring out if somebody does have mold toxicity? Yeah, I start with the questionnaire. I worked really hard on making that something that's quantifiable. I'm a very analytical person. So I wanted to have something where I was able to get a picture of what was going on and then a probability. And what I found is that as patients were filling out the questionnaire, they finally felt validated in a lot of their symptoms that seemed like they were just being hypochondriacs, you know, mm-hmm. and they're, as they're filling it out, they're like, I didn't know that was a mold thing. I didn't know that was a mold thing. I didn't know that someone could understand me when I said, you know, the tags on my shirt drive me crazy. Um, you know, all of these little things that add up to be a a complex picture. If you know it's mold, if you have, you know, a known water damage building exposure um, and you are, you've bought into the idea, it really isn't necessary to do any testing. Just use that money for treatment. And Mm -hmm. I'm trying to scientifically validate my questionnaire. So someone could use the numbers trying to figure out, you know, in my personal quantification from my experience, did I come up with the right numbers and is it valid? Um, numbers are looking good, but I'm trying to get a thousand results so that we can really do a, an adequate study. So I start with the questionnaire. I mean, I start with a good history, physical exam, and then a symptom questionnaire. And that that's really beneficial. And that may be where we stop in some cases if we know that there's been a water damage building exposure. But if we need something like buy-in from another family member, or if we need to know what's our baseline, what's happening, you know, Mm -hmm. let's get a level of, or an idea of, of how bad this is, or, you know, those kinds of things, or maybe which mycotoxins are we looking at? So we can kind of estimate which molds you may have been exposed to, and that helps target the treatment a little bit better. The nice thing about natural medicine is a lot of the things that I write about in my book, like milk thistle and turmeric and vitamin D and green tea, those are things that help detoxify no matter what mycotoxin you're exposed to. So you don't have to be so worried about, because what I find is that as we detox the person, more mycotoxins show up. Than we oh, did, wow. That we didn't see in the beginning because we store them. They're fat soluble. So they just soak into the fatty tissues of our body, like our bone marrow and like our gut lining and our brain and nervous system and all these places that we really need them not to be. Yeah. Okay. No, that's not testing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, that makes sense that, you know, or if you're maybe not a hundred percent, then it's worth testing. Um, And so say you're a family, then is it worth just testing one of you? If you're thinking this might be a possibility because you could have it going on or, or is it best to do everybody? I know it is costly. It was costly for us. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's a lot out of pocket. And um, so I think that the, If it's going to answer, I test if it's going to answer a question we don't know, or if it's going to target activity, you know, target our action. So there are a lot of moldy schools. So if you Mm -hmm. have a symptomatic kid and you test the kid and they're through the roof, let's say on a mycotoxin test or on a mold allergy test, and you can test mycotoxins through 
a blood antibody test for mycotoxins, not just for mold spores, or a urine mycotoxin test. And there's some art to which one you pick. You know, that's kind of, you can talk with your doctor about that. I have a, um, I do a lot of testing, sample testing, where I t send the same sample to different measures to try to figure out, you know, how do we do this best? Mm -hmm. And I have a little um, spreadsheet that your doctor could get for me if they wanted to see like which one and what are the factors we're choosing for what, what method. Um, but if you have a really sick kid and they have a moldy school, they may have a really high test and it may not be your home. Mm -hmm. And then you go through a lot of expense and stress and worry about living in this home. You start to feel like your sanctuary is a place that is harming you. And it may actually be school exposure mm -hmm. or vice versa. You know, it might look completely normal because that's a kid who gets to go away from the house to school. And the people who have, you know, the bedroom right next to the moldy, moldy bathroom or something like that, it is the home, but you've tested one person who's no, not anywhere near that. So ideally we would test the symptomatic people in the, in the family and then try to figure out whether, which building it is, you know, what's, where is the exposure? Um, and if that doesn't answer a question, and ideally it would be people who had different daytime exposures that are out of the house. Of course, right now everybody's at home. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that kind of answers the question. The other confusing thing is some of the mycotoxin testing, like urine mycotoxin testing, you may be, you may have become the sick building. I have some patients that are, it's rare, but whose exposure was 10 years ago and mm -hmm. they're still dumping the toxin because they just took on such a load. Most of the time though, if we see high mycotoxins, there's, uh, there's something going on in the environment. I wrote a book. I'd love for you to check it out. Pendulum by S.E. German is available now. Pendulum is a heartwarming story that follows a young boy who experiences mental health challenges like anxiety, OCD and depression, ADHD and tics following an infection. It turns out he has a little known disorder called PANDAS. The book follows the young boy as he struggles with his health issues as well as regular middle grade issues and it can act as a wonderful catalyst between you and your children to talk about mental health issues and other things that are going on in their life. Pendulum is available online through Amazon Worldwide, Barnes & Noble, the Friesen Press Bookstore, and a number of other online retailers worldwide. And you can check out Chapter 1, the audio version of Pendulum for free on the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast in Episode 64. I hope you enjoy Pendulum by S.E. German and let me know what you think. So let's flip over a bit into the treatment side of things. So it definitely seems like it can be complex. Um, so I'm wondering if you can outline some of the treatment that you use um, and also talk a little bit more about the length of time, because I know you mentioned it can take a while. Yeah. So I really want to change the narrative on the complexity. I don't think it's complex. I think it's timely and that's frustrating, but I don't really see it as being complex. There is, there's so much hope here. So if someone's listening, they're like, <gasps> yeah. Um, in occupational studies where we are able to get long-term data over seven years for remediations in the same building and, you know, thousands of samples and people, 50% of people who get away from the exposure get better doing nothing more. They get better. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I really want to change that narrative that this is really complex. In my, um, I'm probably going to say something very controversial here, but I don't think mold has been treated appropriately because I don't think all of the four factors that the way it can make you sick are being addressed in many mm -hmm. situations. So when you address those, so if you really, really hammer home on the avoidance part, um, the getting away from the exposure, whatever that takes, that alone takes care of 50% of people. And then when you move to the, the people that don't feel better out of the building, then we have tools for that. And there's an order that 
I put in my book that is, I call it peeling the orange. So it's five tools. It's avoidance is number one. And if you're better, then you're done. <laughs> then fundamentals, then protect, then repair, and then fight, meaning fight the fungus back that has moved into your body. When we get to the fundamentals, so avoidance and fundamentals, the reason I use the orange is that those those two really need to be done as close to 100% as possible. Just like you would eat an orange, you would peel that outer orange layer and that white fluffy layer pretty pretty much 100% so that you could get to the intersections of that orange. Then you might pick and choose certain things in the intersections of that orange through protect, repair, and fight that fit you and your symptoms or your um, the exposure that you had. And it, if you work the plan, it really doesn't have, it's not complex, but it can take a long time. And that's where people get frustrated. And the symptoms can get really scary. You know, that people get a diagnosis of atypical MS or dementia. I mean, this is, or an autoimmune disease takes off, you know, then you're dealing with a, another thing you're chasing, but the mold part can be addressed very, very efficiently and with a lot more simplicity than I think um, is out there right now. (laughs) Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And, and certainly, yeah, the avoid one. Um, so the, the fundamentals, is that where you kind of touch on some of the diet and supplements? I know you talked about um, milk thistle earlier and a few others um, like green tea that you're using. Is that where you really drill in on those? Yeah. Fundamentals is kind of, it's a good clean living, you know, it's mm-hmm. like circadian rhythm, stress management, sleep is so important. And that's really tough when you have a kid who's in a flare Right. And they have anxiety and they might have sleep issues, um, especially as they move into their teen years. You still have to be very regimented about getting up in the morning. I know you had a late night, but if we don't get you up in the morning, your body will get used to that new norm. Um, so those are the sorts of things that are involved in fundamentals. And the diet, this is just a therapeutic diet. This is not a lifelong diet. But if you think about the message in the mycotoxin is fungus wants to come in and take over your body. Then for my patients, they taught me this. I was putting them on medicinal mushrooms and kombucha, you know, things to help their microbiome and Mm -hmm. they got sicker. And those that had candida overgrowth because of mold, not because of they took an antibiotic and now they have candida. In the case of taking an antibiotic, there's a start and a stop. When Mm -hmm. it comes to mold exposure, there's no stop part. So if you get candida overgrowth and you're still being exposed to mycotoxins and you take more yeast or you eat more fungus or you take medicinal mushrooms or you eat yeasted bread, your body is going to feel completely unsupported. And that's what my patients taught me. They got worse when we added those kinds of things. So that's how I developed my mold free diet is that we get rid of things that are in the fungus family. So like blue cheese, bye bye. We get rid of things that will increase the possibility of fungal overgrowth or candida overgrowth. So that's sweets, fruit juices, um, you know, yeasts, yeasted breads. And then we get rid of things that tend to have a lot of mycotoxin contamination just by how we process the food. And so that's things like corn, peanuts, soy, some of those foods that we know in studies are pretty highly laden with mycotoxins. And I have the diet in sort of a tier. We have tier one and tier two. Most people feel pretty good just doing the tier one avoidance and then they don't have to go the more extreme. But I also like to talk about what you can do. So I'm all about empowerment. So Mm -hmm. it's not just, okay, you can't do this. You can't do that. (laughs) And I talk about the foods that you should be eating and the, the things that can help process mycotoxins, defend fungus. And we have a ton of herbs and spices that we eat every day that we underestimate how powerful they are because we're used to them. So things like garlic, onions, oregano, rosemary, basil, and then foods that help detoxify, foods that love the liver, like beets, broccoli family, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Broccoli sprouts are phenomenal. Um, Bitter greens, things that taste bitter on our tongue help move bile, and bile is the fluid that gets these mycotoxins out of the body. So bitter greens like arugula and watercress Sometimes that's a little hard to get in a kid. So you might have Mm -hmm. to actually do a little bitter chocolate at the end of a meal 
um, something like that. So working with or bitter orange, you know, using having them like um, I don't know if you've ever seen these grapefruit, like sugared grapefruit snacks. They're like dehydrated, dehydrated grapefruit rind, sort of like the ginger snacks. Okay. You know, they are a wonderful bitter to end a meal on a kid because they tend to like the citrusy flavor and it helps them tolerate that bitter orange, um, bitter citrus kind of taste. So there's just lots of little tips and tricks that we can do to get those flavors into the kid's diet. Turmeric is another wonderful spice. So a lot of kids will like curry. They, you know, will mm-hmm. eat curry. And that's a nice way to get the bitter of turmeric into their into their diet and hide some vegetables. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. And I know like you talk about a lot eating the rainbow and how important all of the different um, colors can really be in in treatment as well. Yeah, there's if you talk to a lot of mold treating people, they will talk about binders. It's one of the first um, things that they hit for treatment. And the idea there is that recognizing that bile is the fluid that carries mycotoxins out of our body. What we're trying to do is bind that bile or grab it so that you poop it out because we're really, really efficient bile recyclers. So we Mm. don't want to recycle this toxin and bring it back into the body. What we found in studies is that insoluble fiber like flaxseed, psyllium husk, like good old Metamucil, um, bran, those are all things that are really good bile binders and they're food. Um, You can also use seeds like pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. And a lot of kids will go ahead and they will eat that. You know, that's a snack. Mm -hmm. Uh, And here you are having them eat a snack and binding bile. It's just fantastic. Pumpkin seeds sesame seeds, you can do a lot with those kinds of things. So the, um, the, the binders, you can also use pharmaceuticals, but they also can bind good fat soluble nutrients. And we have a kid with pandas or pans, they need a ton of DHA to feed their brain. And we don't want to lose those. We don't want to lose the good fat soluble nutrients either, like vitamin D and vitamin A that helps them defend from further infection. So I'm, I don't use pharmaceuticals unless it's a really critical situation. And now I, I lost the rest of your question. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's really helpful. I was kind of just digging in a little bit to the diet and then the supplement oh, yeah. piece. Oh, so right, no. yeah, you. like one of the ones we've used a lot was um, Reservatrol. Uh-huh. I'm not, I'm not yeah. sure if I'm saying it right, but um, yeah. yeah. And so I just wondered, yeah, if there are others that, that you highly recommend. Definitely. Oh, yeah. So I I brought up the binders because in my research in animal studies on mold, I found that they were using bioflavonoids much more than binders or in addition to binders. But they would start with the bioflavonoids. And what that means is the colorful pigment in vegetables and fruit, because fruit can if if a kid is eating too much fruit, it can be too much sugar and can cause yeast problems. Mm. I really hone in on the veggies and then the bioflavonoids from those veggies. So resveratrol is a fantastic bioflavonoid for mold. It supports the detoxification pathways in the liver and the detox of organs, but it also helps stabilize blood vessels and it helps all all this stuff in the periphery, like out in the, the dark realms of the body, it's helping to clear out those mycotoxins from the outer tissues. If someone has a lot of allergies, quercetin is another really nice one. When it comes to pandas and pans, some kids don't tolerate quercetin, so they need to use its cousin called luteolin or rutin. Um, but it's a wonderful yellow, orangey color, and it's it's kind of neon yellow actually. And that one is really particular to mucous membranes and allergies. So if you have um, a lot of sinusitis or hay fever asthma, or even just a tricky gut, if that's how your body expresses allergies, or histamine issues where a kid goes to sleep, you know, five minutes after they eat, that's a histamine problem. You can use things like quercetin for that. And then green tea, the the phenols in green tea are some of the most powerful bioflavonoids that we have, especially when it comes to mold. Is there a little bit antifungal? So you don't, you're entering, you're sneaking into the fifth 
tool, <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the fight tool. You can sneak into it a little bit by using green tea because it has a tiny bit of antifungal property, but it's antitoxin and antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. So green tea is sort of one of our everybody drink it every day kind of thing. That <laughs> we're just trying to make sure that people keep a nice stream of green tea coming in throughout the morning. It can keep you up at night. So, you know, mm -hmm. if it's um, liquid or non-decaffeinated, then uh, you might need to make sure you're doing it earlier in the day. But most of the capsules of green tea are decaffeinated. Okay. So for children, like, would you recommend the capsules or? If I they we do the tea. Yeah. I okay. Mean, green tea is, is using green tea is as old as dirt. You know, we've used that for a long, long time and other other cultures have that as their breakfast drink instead of coffee. So yeah, we just use it in the, in the morning time. And it can really help with focus and calm. The nice thing about green tea is it has just as much of a calming um, agent called theanine as it does caffeine. So you get, you get a lift and a calm instead of like caffeine from a soda, which is just, you know, mm -hmm. hummingbird mode. <laughs> kind of bananas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, no, that's really helpful. Um, and so we didn't get too much into the how long. Like, so does it really uh, range depending on the exposure or completely. how does it work? Yeah, yeah okay. completely. Yes. So it can be anywhere from, oh, I feel usually people have a lift, they feel a little bit better within their first month, and they know they're on the right track. Okay. And then an increasing lift and an increasing lift. Sometimes you have to have a lift and then a crash. I have a graphic in my book that says how healing really works. Healing is messy. And we want it to be like, I'm doing all the right things. And so every day I want an incremental improvement. That's not how detox works. The way detox works and things that have to do with colonization or microbial imbalance is you get a little leg up. And just as you put that second foot on the rug, <laughs> body says, yay, we have enough energy to get rid of something. Or yay, we have enough energy to fight the fungus off. And then you have a little bit of a crash. So it's a lot of ups and downs. And the key is just if, you're, if your ups are higher and you're getting more time and more days up, and if your lows are not as bad and you're getting shorter periods of your low, you're on the right track. And that's how you heal from mold. And it can be anywhere from one month before you feel better to three months before you start to feel a lift. And the total duration of treatment, especially using nasal sprays, can be up to two years in some cases. That's going to be the end point. Like that's the more extreme. Okay. Okay. No, that makes sense. And and we did see that. So my son, you know, we felt like we had that lift and then it was sort of like a, a backwards. Um, so that's interesting that that's, mm -hmm. that's typical. Okay. Cause I was like, maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't mold. Maybe we, yes. <laughs> even that's though we, cool. we tested and we know that it is, but I still <laughs> I know, I know because you're, you're saying, wait, we're not getting the rewards. We're not yeah. getting, and with autoimmune disease, that really throws a curveball in the whole picture. You're going to, the, the, slip or the is a flare also because now the immune system has a little more vitality and it has a lot of complaining to do mm. so it's been suppressed and so now you can see a kid when they get a sore throat it's like huge red sore throat and you're like oh my gosh do we have strep again mm -hmm. so we have strep tests and it's fine and i have to say for pandas and pans make sure you're looking at the at the bottom because a lot of cases are negative at the throat but then they have strep on their bottom so it could be strep but or let's say a skin flare mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's a massive skin flare and you're thinking what in the world are we doing wrong you're not doing anything wrong the body is pushing things out through its easiest organ of detoxification so watching and that's where it's nice to work with a mold literate doctor who can kind of be your body translator, um, helping you understand that the body heals by pushing things out from the deepest, most critical tissues, like the brain stem, like the bone marrow, out to the surface. And that's how we heal. And that's why things can look worse, but we're actually getting better. Interesting. Okay. And I can see yeah, that that's definitely, well, and for a lot of pandas, pans parents, you know, feels like that kind of roller coaster that we're sort of mm -hmm. used to. Mm -hmm. um, 
with the disorder. Uh, yeah. And I know my son had just been complaining, like, I swear he had canker sores for like a week. And now I'm just kind of wondering, you mentioned skin, um, mm-hmm. if maybe, maybe that could be part of it. So that's, that's really interesting. Um, and so you did say working with a mold literate doctor can be advantageous. I guess that's what I was wondering, you know, we did go and have been working with his naturopath, but I sort of thought, well, I wonder, you know, if you need it, like you've written this awesome book. Um, and, and I'm sure for people, especially that are maybe, um, having financial challenges, it is something that you, you could work through sort of how you've broken it down into these steps on your own then. Yeah. And I think once you have a secondary condition from the mold exposure, that's where you're going to save a lot of time and frustration having someone oversee it because they Mm -hmm. can be that body translator. But for your garden variety mold exposed person, if there is such a thing. um, Yeah. I mean, I've, I've gotten countless hundreds of emails of people just saying, I worked your plan. I'm so much better. Thank you so much. You know, and they just were able to take it and run with it. And um, that's just so beautiful to hear. I would say in my in my experience with my patients, if there's a secondary condition, though, like autoimmune disease or dementia or cancer or, you know, it's really severe gut problems or something like that. That's where it's nice to use a doc. So I'm help that makes out. sense. Mm hmm. Um, and so if they are trying to do it on their own using the book, then I think there would be definitely the link to all the supplements. And so are they able to buy those through you? Um, I'm working on that. I didn't realize that was going to be a thing I needed to do. So, <laughs> so I'm working on that. Yeah, they can go to my website and I have some things that I'm really picky about formulation Um, And I understand that pill fatigue is a real thing, Mm -hmm. you know, so we're working on trying to find more. Most things on my website are capsules. So we're working on trying to find the things that my next book is on pandas and pans. Oh, wow. And a lot of kids can't swallow pills. So we're working to find some resources for people um, so that they can get this stuff into, into their kids. And some creative ways to do that. (laughs) That would be amazing. We have struggled with the resveratrol because it comes in quite a big capsule. And so I've taken to opening it up and putting it into like a small amount of like smoothie type Mm -hmm. thing. But oh, my son really struggles to get it down. It's it's Um, horrible. So and that's that shouldn't be because it's such a yummy um, bioflavonoid. It's like Uh syrup. Oh, so wow. There is a there is a liquid that I use called Reserve Age Okay. Um, that I use with Panda's Kids. It's not as clean a source as I would love, um, but it is, like I said, I'm working on that. I'm trying yeah. to, I'm working with a company called the Light Health Formulas to get formulations. Um, so I'm trying to be, you know, really careful about things that are going in and um, yeah, we're working on that. <laughs> that's, There's, that's the other thing is like, if you put everything in a smoothie, you're going to lose smoothies. So I recommend for patients that for parents of kids, you know, special kids have three different ways that you're going to get that in and plan it ahead of time because you will get refusal and they need it. So mm-hmm. if it's always going in a smoothie, then the kid starts to like hate the smoothie or refuse the smoothie. Think about getting things into kids using savory versus then not always sweet. So oh, interesting. things in um, soy sauce, in spaghetti sauce, in things that you might be able to use. Curry is a great place to hide things. Um, other ways of getting it in and using savory is a nice way to, to hide stuff. That's a good idea. Okay. That's one I didn't think of. We did actually try other sweets, like even pudding and stuff. And I was just like, mm-hmm. no, it was. <laughs> it was I know. And then you take their treat away. You know? I know. So, I know. <laughs> yeah. But do expect refusal. I think that's just working with kids in general, whether it's, mm-hmm. you know, pandas and pans or just children. It's like they, I would have my, um, the kids come into my medicinary and they get to pick the additive to their tincture. I just tell them it's going to be really gross. But you get to pick the flavor. So do you want ginger? Do you want orange? Do you want fennel? You know, all kids love different things. And so Mm -hmm. um, then we could say with parent right there in the medicinary, okay, now you chose it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so they have backup. They can say, well, you were right there. And Dr. Jill said you had to, you know, so it is nice to have a doctor who can like be the boss, you know, and, and then give you other ideas for, 
okay, when this doesn't work, here's your alternate way to get this into the into your child and get ready for that because it'll happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have those days where they're just, especially because I do it in the morning usually and it's sort of like that, no, <laughs> kind of response. And, oh. Yeah, no, yeah it doesn't feel good. <laughs> breakfast is hard because, you know, we in America, we do sweets. And so mm-hmm. when we switched our family to things like breakfast enchiladas, um, boy, that was a difference because I could also get bitter stuff in and, you know, some of the ickier medicine. So, you know, thinking about breakfast a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a good tip. Um, So no, I think this is super helpful. It's definitely broken, broken this down a little bit for me for sure. Um, And you mentioned you're doing a new book on pandas pants. Can you talk a little bit about that or? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, (laughs) The target date is May of 2022. Um, and it's, I'm gearing it to be a truly integrative uh, book where if your child is one who needed IVIG, what are the things you can do to support IVIG to work better? Um, if your child can't tolerate antibiotics, what are some other ways that you could do that? Because every child is on a different spectrum, you know, of what mm-hmm. they can tolerate and what they need for protecting from infection. And I have found that, you um, treating the sinuses in the mouth with mouthwashes and or sprays, throat sprays, those kind of things, just as a prevention, not just the oral antibiotics, but you know, where someone's taking antibiotics, there might be a plant way to do that. (laughs) So I want to teach people about that. I mean, there are plant ways and to try to use as much plant medicine because it's so elegant. The plants handle so many different things and mechanisms involved in this condition rather than a single acting monofocused pharmaceutical. But if you need to use pharmaceuticals, which we did in our family, how do you combine all of it safely? So Mm -hmm. my goal and what I'm really cranking on this week is um, my medication compatibility chart so that you can know what goes with what and some of the more um, disruptive type symptoms. What are some of the tricks and tips for getting through that? So insomnia, food refusal, tics, um, some of those things. So I'm hoping it'll be similar to my mold book where it's uh, user-friendly and is addressing some of the big pain points for parents. Wow, that sounds honestly really exciting and super useful. I think that will be great. Thank you. Yeah, I just need to hear it again. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's a tall order. It's yeah, I, I write as well. I know it can be oh, one of yeah. those things. It's like getting your butt in the seat and just getting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm it, my butt's in the seat, but then I get off on all these tangents yeah. of like, oh, I wonder if I should put this in the book. So yeah, I'm at that place where I, it's now the trim down. Like, what are the main pain points? And just, you know, bring it down. And I can always do a course on a special topic later for that's yeah, that's yeah. a good point. That's Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess last would be how can listeners find out more about you, your work, your book? Yeah, they can go to drkrista.com. That's D-R-C-R-I-S-T-A.com. It's very mold focused because we're I'm still, you know, there's still a lot to be done in the mold world. Um, so if you're looking for a lot of pandas information, there's not a ton there, but I do have a class on pandas and pans fundamentals. Okay. Um, and that's on my courses page. And I have um, been on social media. I've been taking a summer break to get my book done. So I'm just about to reenter on Instagram, Facebook, um, and YouTube. They're little short snippet videos for people with brain fog or not enough time. So they're usually a minute or less, very topic focused um, videos. And there's a treasure trove of information there. And then my book is called Break the Mold. Perfect. And that's available, I'm sure, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Big box stores, Amazon, and from my website. And then Perfect. my website does have some of the supplements you were talking about that are pretty mold focused so that they will help you go through the steps in the book on the detox part, the bile moving part, the binding part, the um, biofilm busting, you know, those kind of things. And they're in combination formulas so that you don't have to take like eight bottles of things a day. Oh, yeah. No, that's great. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely helpful. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot. And I think the listeners will definitely learn a lot too. Great. Thank you for the invitation. It just, it means a lot. 
Thank you so much to Dr. Krista for her time in breaking down everything to do with mold, why we should care about it, who's vulnerable, how we can actually treat it, and then go on to living our healthiest life. I think there is so much here that is definitely comforting in that it's proactive. We can do something when we discover that there is a mold issue in our building or whether the child or yourself does um, test that they've got mycotoxins, it, it, there is actually something we can do. And I think that's really encouraging, though it you know can be overwhelming when we, we start to break down that. And I love that her new book, Break the Mold, really helps us to understand what we should do to tackle this issue. If you want to find out more from Dr. Krista, you can go to drkrista.com. You can also... Go to the classes that she mentioned that are available on there and then look for her book pretty much everywhere books are sold called Break the Mold. This interview has been so helpful to me, and I hope it has been to you as well. If you do like the podcast, please consider rating, reviewing the podcast, promoting it on your social media. If this episode in particular, you found that there was some great information, you can take a picture with your phone and then post that and help to get it out there because I really do think this is a misunderstood area where you know we can really make some progress. Thanks for listening and have a great week. I'm excited to announce the launch of my author website, www.se-german.com. On this website, you can find out all the information about my publications, focused areas on my novel, Pendulum by S.E. German, where there are questions for parents as you work through the novel with your children, as well as teacher resources that can be used in the classroom. There's also information about the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast and recent press. Please visit www.se-german.com. Thank you for listening to the Learning to Slay the Beast podcast. Please keep in mind this podcast is not intended to be medical or professional advice. If you are looking for that advice, please seek that out from a professional. If you'd like to hear more from me, you can visit my blog, www.theallergybeast.wordpress.com, or follow me online at Sarah Lady Gluten on Instagram, S A R A L A D Y G L U T E N, or the Facebook page, Sarah Hyphen Lady Gluten. If you do like the podcast, please consider subscribing so that you will get the podcast update every week and or reviewing the podcast on whatever platform you listen to. Thanks again and have a great week.